start the recording. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to introduce to this morning's panel. It's the book contributors uh, panel one called Reflection, Contemplation, and Meditative Inquiry. Our first speaker is Dr. Adrian Downey. And Dr. Downey is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax. His work focuses on curriculum, inquiry, social justice, and Indigenous education. His talk today is titled Mindset and Meditative Inquiry. Uh, following that, we'll have Dr. Christina Fleming. Dr. Christina Fleming comes from a journalism, writing, and literature background from both King's University and Concordia University, and is an arts-informed researcher. She explores diverse research methodology with a focus on the arts. Her talk today is titled, Arts and Letters, Meditative Inquiry as Invitation. Following this, we have Dr. Chris McCaw and Dr. John Kay. Dr. Chris McCaw is a lecturer in education at the at, sorry, Melbourne Graduate School of Education. His research focuses on the art of teaching and the integration of contemplative practices. Dr. John Kay is associate professor in education at the Graduate School of Education in Melbourne as well. He has published several books and journal articles around the philosophy of education and the outdoors. Their talk today is titled Meditative Inquiry in Dialogue with Heideggerian, Deweyan, and Buddhist Praxis. Welcome to all our panelists. And we're just going to highlight our meditation today by Dr. Christina Fleming. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I should say that I'm not a doctor yet. I'm still working on my PhD, but it was nice to hear that. It <laughs> definitely made my morning. Uh, so for the meditative activity today, we're just going to focus on being a little more attentive and just tuning in to the sounds around us. And it's only going to be about a three minute exercise, um, but I invite everyone, if you feel comfortable, to just close your eyes and just maybe take a deep breath, settle into your body a bit, and then just start listening. What do you hear? in your space. Do you hear any sounds that are typical of your day or any different sounds that you don't usually hear? If the sounds you could hear now were colors, what what color would the sound you hear be? And notice if you're just running through your to-do list or if you're really actually just listening rather than thinking.
Maybe notice whether the sounds are coming from outside or inside your space. And maybe just take one more minute to uh, just tune into that sense of awareness and think about how you can carry this sense of peace um, throughout the rest of your day and maybe throughout the rest of the sessions you attend. And when you're ready, um, open your eyes and that's the end of your listening exercise. Thank you so much, Christina. All right, I'm going to bring in Dr. Downey. Hi. Okay. Over to you. Yeah. Okay, so good morning, folks. Uh, presentation I'm giving today, uh, I'm going to kind of try to keep it informal and um, I don't have like a slideshow or anything. I'm just going to talk through the chapter um and some of my thoughts since um that chapter was originally written um before i get too far into it i do want to begin by acknowledging um that i'm coming to you today from the unceded and unpurchased territory of the Mi'kmaq nation um specifically the territory of, of chipoktok halifax which is also where mount saint vincent university is located and um you know, when I when I think about land, it's really hard for me to give a short land acknowledgement. <laughs> As my grad students will attest, they often take like 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> so um, I'll try to condense. But like when I think of giving a land acknowledgement, I, I really do think back to like, what was this territory before it was Halifax? And uh, the Mi'kmaq historian Daniel Paul has told us that um, Chipuktuk Halifax was Mi'kmaq moose hunting territory. Um, and when Governor Cornwallis, Edward Cornwallis, the founder of Halifax, came here in uh, 1749 and did so in direct violation of the peace and friendship treaties that were signed first in 1725 and then ratified in 1726, you know, um, I, I guess he didn't get the memo that <laughs> Chipuktuk was Mi'kmaq moose hunting territory. And so he set up this lovely city we now have up as Halifax um, and did so uh, kind of immediately through violent genocide with the, the scalping proclamation that he issued, uh, issuing a bounty on Mi'kmaq scalps. Um, and so I like to, <laughs> as dark a, a way that is to start the morning, I like to remember that when I'm giving the land acknowledgement that this land was something before it was Halifax, it was Chipuktuk, and it has a history well below, well before any of us were here, or, or in many cases, even our ancestors. Um, so I ask us to, you know, remember uh, the history of this territory, that it, it has a, uh, a history well beyond us. Um, and hold that in our hearts today as we have these conversations in Sinolkama. Um, so as I get into my presentation, I should also acknowledge that um, the, the chapter that appears in Ashwani's book um, was originally published uh, in the Journal of Educational Thought at the University of Calgary uh, in 2019. And I originally wrote this paper in, in 2018, so about four years ago, actually pretty much to the day four years ago since I submitted it. And, um, you know, it's really hard sometimes to um, go back to those ideas that you had four years ago and, and to speak them again. So um, just <laughs> be generous, I guess, with, with this. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll go through the, the paper um, and then at the end, as time allows, I'll give some of the thinking, um, that how my thinking has developed around meditative inquiry and related thoughts, um, since the paper came out originally. 
Um, and I should say as well, like I'm very grateful to Ashwani um, for inviting me to bring this paper that I wrote to um, the book. And Ashwani has been nothing but generous in our interactions and our relationships. And uh, um, you know, I'm really grateful to him for for many things. Um, okay, so to begin with, this chapter really comes out of. Um, here's the story. Uh, I was. <laughs> You know, I was really interested in Ashwani's work on meditative inquiry, um, kind of uh, for my own reasons, I guess, while I was a, a teacher, I was a music teacher in Northern Quebec. And I, what I was really drawn to was the um, mix of critical theory and spiritual philosophy in Ashwani's work. And I thought that was really interesting. And so I read his dissertation uh, and then I read his book and Eventually, Ashwani and I sat down and had a series of dialogues, uh, which were the dialogue project. And my role in that was really asking questions. And, um, you know, uh, for me, you know, trying to be a learner as much as possible and, and learn from Ashwani and his wisdom and, um, you know, give him an opportunity to, to talk out his ideas as well. Um, so I was deeply steeped in that experience going into my PhD, and there was a conference actually at MSVU where um, there was a presentation on growth mindset, which was an idea I hadn't heard of before. This was about 2016, 2017, and in that presentation, I asked the group, you know, does this idea of, of um, growth mindset kind of adhere with non-Western systems of thought. Um, and we didn't really come to an answer in that session, but somebody came up to me afterwards and they quoted scripture, which is always a great way to start a conversation. Um, I didn't realize it was scripture at the time, but they said um, it's from Proverbs 25 two, and it says, um, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing but the honor of Kings to search a matter out. And so basically what she was saying to me was keep asking questions. Um, and so I've kind of taken that as, as a mantra <laughs> in some ways. And, and I do, you know, try to ask questions as much as possible. And um, this paper really arose from the process of asking that question, you know, um, is meditative inquiry, what does it have to say in a conversation with um, growth mindset and vice versa? And so, you know, this is kind of situated in the complicated conversation of curriculum studies or uh, comparative education. And it's also informed by, again, that, that axiom of, of asking questions. So what I'll do and what I do in the paper is just go over mindset, how I understand meditative inquiry, talk about the um, interconnections or, or tensions between the two, and then I'll, I'll talk about some of my other uh, thoughts since. So mindset, growth mindset, for folks who aren't familiar with this idea, it's, um, uh, it emerges from Carol Dweck's work. Carol Dweck is a um, psychologist education person at uh, Stanford, I believe. Um, and it became really popular in the early 2000s. There was a TED Talk, The Power of Yet, um, that really brought it to wider attention. But the idea of growth mindset actually emerges from about 20 years of empirical research conducted by Dweck in her lab at Stanford. Um, and so the idea really breaks down like this. Um, it's, it really hinges around the power of yet. And I like to explain this with the example of being a race car driver. So if I'm operating in the what's called the fixed mindset or um, you know, what Dweck calls in other academic writing, like an, uh, an entity self-belief, I would say, I am not a great race car driver, period, right? Um, there's no possibility of me ever becoming a great race car driver. I'm just a bad race car driver. That's it. That's the fixed, um, fixed mindset or entity self-belief. So it's kind of abstract with the race car driver thing, but you can think about this in all kinds of ways. I'm a bad um, you know, writer, I'm a bad listener. Those kind of self-beliefs are, are called entity. That's the fixed mindset. Dweck also has um, 
this idea of the growth mindset or what in your academic writing is called an incremental self-belief. Um, so this is the idea that I am not a great race car driver yet. Um, and this simple word yet at the end of that sentence for Dweck and those who follow growth mindset um, acknowledges that change is possible, that I, I can become better. I can become a great race car driver if I put in the time, the effort, um, and I, I go about it in a good way, I can become better at it. So that's the idea of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Um, and Dweck throughout all her writing is unapologetically in favor of the growth mindset. She has argued this and, and proven to some degree within uh, the empirical paradigm that operating within a growth mindset can be very advantageous, especially for school age kids. Um, so that's mindset. Part two, um, meditative inquiry. So we've, we've talked a lot about meditative inquiry and I don't think I need to, to go too far into it. Um, I'll just share like my understanding of it and, and the particular emphasis I use in this paper. Um, so obviously, you know, it's based on the spiritual philosophy of Jiddu Krishnamurti and conversation with curriculum theorists such as um, James McDonald and, and Bill Pinar uh, and, you know, Ashwani talked a lot about that yesterday. Um, the core emphasis I see in this paper or, or the thing that I think is really interesting to put in conversation with Dweck's work is this idea that meditative inquiry is about accepting who we are at our core um, rather than striving to become something else, right? Coming in contact with uh, our true self and accepting that as, as it is, as flawed. Um, yeah, and so if we can accept who we are, we can be free from this continual striving or, or becoming. And Ashwani has a really great quote that I, I think really summarizes the emphasis I'm trying to give here which is, uh, and I apologize because it's not a direct quote, <laughs> but um, essentially, once we have come at ourselves with an ideal in mind, um, so, you know, the ideal man or the ideal uh, partner or the ideal writer, um, we've already gone against ourselves. Uh, and so that process of striving, I think, is really interesting to put in conversation with um, something like growth mindset, which is explicitly about striving. So that's my understanding of meditative inquiry in a limited sense within the scope of time and space that we have to converse about it here. <laughs> so what happens if you put these things in conversation? Um, because that's the really generative thing, I think. So the fixed mindset and meditative mind or, or meditative inquiry, they share an acceptance of the self, but for vastly, vastly different reasons. So if you remember the fixed mindset is I am not a, I am not a great race car driver, period. Um, so this is an acceptance of the self at a very superficial level. It's an acceptance of the limitation of the self um, that I'm not a great race car driver. There's an acceptance there. But it's a very superficial acceptance. It's rooted in insecurity most of the time, right? It's, it's um, you know, psychoanalysis would say it's, it's a defense mechanism uh, of saying, you know, it's, it's splitting, it's separating the self from the thing, the self, the self from the bad thing. Um, meditative inquiry asks us to go a little bit deeper, right? It says, so, so why, why? do you think you're a bad race car driver? Um, you know, why is it important? Why is it, um, you know, maybe ask some more questions about that. It's hard for me to think of the example of being a <laughs> race car driver, but like if, if I'm a bad parent, if I believe that about myself and some people do, or, if, you know, I'm a bad human being, some people believe this about themselves, like interrogating that, that's the process of meditative inquiry. And as I understand it, at meditative inquiry, when we get to the real reason that we believe that about ourselves, the, the deep conflict within ourselves, then there's an acceptance. Um, and so while on the surface, you know, fixed mindset and meditative inquiry might share that 
idea of an acceptance, they're operating at two vastly different levels. Um, so that's kind of the first interesting interaction there. Um, the second, so when you put growth mindset um, in conversation with meditative inquiry, I think there's this shared emphasis on human potential, right? Uh, Ashwani yesterday talked about how holistic education grew out of the human potential movement. And, and there's certainly some elements of that uh, coming through in Ashwani's uh, philosophy of meditative inquiry as well. He might not agree with that, but I think there is. <laughs> um, and, and growth mindset is very much about actualizing your full potential, right? Of becoming the best version of yourself that you can become. I think the difference here though, and, and I wanna um, emphasize this, is whether growth is seen as a goal or a byproduct. Um, and here I think about the example um, of uh, in um, meditative inquiry, music as meditative inquiry that Ashwani gave uh, his own pursuit of Indian classical music. Um, and, you know, he wasn't, and as he said this many times, he wasn't establishing outcomes, which he was pursuing. He was just driven by a passion for music. Um, and, you know, he could have stepped back and said, okay, I want to be a better Indian classical music player. Uh, I am not a great singer or a great tabla player or a great harmonium player yet, you know, operating in that growth mindset. And he might have made incremental progress toward becoming a better harmonium player, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, within that, you miss sort of the holistic engagement with life, right? It becomes very instrumentalized, very incremental. And you miss that kind of organic um, engagement with life, uh, for lack of a better term, that I, I think is at the core of meditative inquiry. So it, it is, I, I think when you operate from the perspective of med meditative inquiry, that growth will happen, uh, but not on its own, or not, not because you forced it to happen. And I think Ashwani has been very clear about that, especially in the paper on um, Indian classical music. So that's, that's kind of where I see the conversation happening. So I'll offer a few preliminary conclusions. Um, and I've already said one of them, which is that I think when you're operating from that meditative mind, and I would say it's a meditative mind unset because I think it's fluid. Um, it's not quite set in the way that Dweck would present it. I think that facilitates growth. I think it's a, a wide kind of expansive definition of growth, but I, I think it does. Um, that's the conclusion that I came to in the paper four years ago. The conclusion I have today, I think, is not to prescribe meditative inquiry as a panacea for all that ails us. Um, I think uh, kind of as we talked about yesterday, um, meditative inquiry might need like some understanding of, of um, you know, critical race theory to, to supplement it in some way to understand those critical issues. Um, but maybe that's just my own perspective. <laughs> um, the other thing I'll say is that I think meditative inquiry in my own experience anyway, is a very difficult uh, and recursive process. It's not kind of this one time thing. It's a, it's a process and it's difficult. Um, and I know that Ashwani has said that, um, you know, meditation is as easy as a flower coming into bloom. Uh, and I, I think I agree with that. But at the same time, uh, I look at what I think of as the material conditions of the post-human convergence um, that we're all living through, you know, the, the Anthropocene, the uh, sixth extinction event, the um, al alacrity of technological change amid the uh, fourth uh, industrial revolution. Like it's a really complicated world that we're living in. And if you look outside, sometimes the flowers aren't blooming. Um, so I, I think, you know, meditative inquiry amid the material circumstances that, you know, certain folks more than others, um, but we all in some capacity are living through is um, it's a difficult thing. Um, 
maybe that's just my perspective running on, you know, five hours of sleep, <laughs> but that's how I feel today. Um, with all that said, I think meditative inquiry is a valuable asset. Um, that's the wrong language, but I, I think it's, it's useful. It's productive to operate on that, um, way of peeling back the onions of our conditionings of trying to come in contact with our true self, even though, you know, I'm agnostic about the existence of a true self. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing, is my time almost up or do I have a couple minutes? You have a couple minutes. Yeah. I have a couple minutes. Perfect. So yeah, I, I think meditative inquiry is, is valuable in the conversation around education and it certainly opens us up to new possibilities. And I think that's always productive. So, um, you know, I, I believe in it from that capacity and I, um, yeah, just since I wrote the paper, I, I think I've grown really critical of this idea of growth. Um, I think in Western society, uh, based on neoliberal economic models that, that growth is really central to um, the way we conceptualize society and, and even the foundations of education like Dewey, you know, was, was a big proponent of growth for its own sake in, in, in education. And in, he was critiqued for that idea. Um, and so I, I think troubling this idea of growth beyond the growth mindset um, is, is something that we ought to be engaged with and troubling the foundations, you know, uh, and, and in terms of doing this, you know, Kieran Egan has some good work around the progressive inheritance of education and critiquing that. There are various critiques of growth from indigenous studies and education. Uh, E.F. Schumacher has written some critiques of the idea of growth in, um, you know, he has that book, uh, Small is Beautiful Economics as, uh, as Though People Mattered. Um, and so there's, there's a long kind of history of, of critiquing this idea, this obsession with growth, um, both in terms of economics, but also in terms of, you know, the way we conceptualize ourselves. And I think Ashwani's meditative inquiry fits within that um, trajectory of critique. Um, you know, seeing growth as a byproduct rather than um, a goal. Um, my own critique there, you know, if you want to look up my writing, <laughs> is about loss. Um, you know, I don't think about growth as much as I think about change in education. I think education is all about change, and I think change always comes with loss. Um, and yeah, I think we have to do a better job of mourning what we lose through the process of education and paying attention to those losses. Um, and I don't need to go into Judith Butler's grief ability stuff here right now, but <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's my time. <laughs> Excuse any uh, slippages or, or uh, ranting because it's, you know, I woke up at 4.30 this morning, so <laughs> pick it up. That was perfect. Thank you so much. There's so many good things there to unpack. Um, so we'll bring you back in for the Q&A at the end. And for those watching, please save your questions for Dr. Downey and, and put them in the chat after. So we'll just bring in Christina. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, speaking of limited sleep, I'll just preface this by saying that I have COVID right now. I feel a little, you know, when you go on one of those carnival rides that spins around and around and you get a little dizzy, that's kind of where I am today, but um, it's gonna be great. So I'll get started by sharing my screen. Um, so this is myself and my daughter, Matilda. Um, it seems appropriate, I think, to begin my presentation with a photo of us together because the chapter I wrote for Eshwani's book um, contains a letter that I wrote to Matilda. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I am a doctoral student in the Inner University PhD program at Mount St. Vincent. University, as well as managing editor of the journal Art Research International um, and part time faculty at the Mount as well. I used letter writing as a research method during the development of my research. And in fact, the letter writing eventually led me to my research methodology, autoethnography. As said by the 12th century nun Heloise, 
If a picture, which is but a mute representation of an object, can give such pleasure, what cannot letters inspire? They have souls, they can speak, they have in them all that force which expresses the transports of the heart. Um, and as you can see in the picture here, well, her boyfriend Peter really seemed to like the letter writing as well. Uh, but in my case, I would say that letter writing led me to autoethnography uh, because I came to realize that I really liked bridging the divide between my own lived experience and wider socio-cultural issues. Uh, more specifically, within the chapter I wrote um, in Ashwani's book, I explored the notion that art processes and autoethnographic writing both share various commonalities with the notion of meditative inquiry as I understood it. So I came to this idea that autoethnographic writing is a lot like meditative inquiry because of my own autoethnographic approach and process. Um, there are different ways, of course, to approach any type of writing, autoethnographic writing included, but my approach um, centered around writing as inquiry. As you see on the slide here, and as St. Pierre famously suggests, writing is thinking, writing is analysis, writing is indeed a seductive and tangled method of discovery. So in other words, I used writing as a way to find out what I was thinking and as a way to tell my own story. So my overall goal for this session is to introduce you to the idea that autoethnographic writing does share certain similarities with meditative inquiry. And then I'm going to share a piece of my own writing with you at the end, and therefore a piece of my own story. If you're not familiar with autoethnographic methodology, if you're saying, what, what is that? Um, I often tell people it's, it's akin to the academic version of memoir writing. And as Lori Nielsen notes, story and narrative, whether nonfiction or fiction, as if we could locate that border, are liminal spaces that do not call for an answer in the same way our conventional notions of knowledge seek an answer. So this is the first parallel I saw between my own autoethnographic process and meditative inquiry. Um, meaning practitioners of meditative inquiry are directed to observe and understand existentially and meditatively rather than rushing into a search for answers. Um, so therefore uh, there's an emphasis on embracing uncertainty. And as someone who takes an exploratory approach to research, the idea of embracing uncertainty resonated deeply with me. And of course, um, that's very, it's very easy to say, let's embrace uncertainty, let's see what happens. But, you know, in, in reality or in practice, it's, it's much more difficult to actually sit with uncertainty because we're always seeking answers, it seems. <clears throat> Toward the beginning of my chapter in the book, I reference a list of attributes that the late Australian curator Nick Waterloo thought essential for all art curators to maintain. So he thought every art curator should have this list, passion, an eye of discernment, an empty vessel, an ability to be uncertain, belief in the necessity of art and artists, a medium, and making possible the altering of perception. And this is a list that I always return to. I find I'm always going back to this list because I think it's important for researchers to possess as well. In particular, of course, the fourth characteristic on the list, an ability to be uncertain. The second parallel I found between autoethnography and meditative inquiry is that an autoethnographer takes everyday moments and thoughts and shapes them into stories. And in a similar way, meditative inquiry also calls for a deep engagement with everyday life. Uh, in Ashwani's words, the first significant aspect of developing awareness is to give careful attention through astute observation and listening to one's body, body thoughts, and emotions 
as well as to the people and environment one interacts with in daily living. And again, I think it's easy to say these things, but in these days of Zoom meetings and rushing around and testing positive for COVID, um, it can be hard to sort of slow down and, and tune in to, to the everydayness. Uh, Ashwani also suggests that learning, in his view, is neither sequential nor linear. And this nonlinear process is also a key aspect of my own autoethnographic writing process. Arthur Bachner, um, who's one of the fathers of, of the methodology, asserts that autoethnography encompasses a writing style that creates structurally complex narratives, stories told in a temporal framework that rotates between past and present, reflecting the nonlinear process of memory work, the curve of time. So in other words, autoethnographic writing of the process is akin to the way we learn because it's non-linear, it's not sequential. And of course, um, we're always shifting and seeing things from different perspectives. So I might publish a story today. And well, as Adrian said, he, he wrote that chapter four years ago. So he has a bit of a different perspective today than he did when the, the chapter was written. So. Again, there's that back and forth in time that happens. Um, but as Laurel Richardson says, I consider writing itself to be discovery. Richardson asserts, I love to follow my own lines of flight, trusting the flights will lead to interesting discoveries and a clarity, certainty of voice that might inspire others to hone and seek theirs. Um, so the other thing about autoethnographic methodology is that you get a little, it gets a little personal at times. Um, so now I'm about to tell you a little bit about me. So during the pandemic, I personally went through a lot of life changes. Um, and aside from my need to write as a researcher and as a student and as an autoethnographer, I found that I had an almost physical need to write in order to survive it all. So in 2020, I separated from my husband, who is still one of my best friends. I found out that my daughter may be on the autism spectrum, and I also came out as queer. When my coming out was not accepted by those closest to me, places and spaces then held a different weight. They had a new meaning because I needed to feel safe and secure somewhere. This is a picture of the Mount Library which was largely in darkness as there were no students there to set off the sensor lights. It was just me. And um, it really was the perfect place for someone trying not only to figure out their doctoral research, but their entire life really. As Sarah Ahmed writes, to leave a path can be to leave a life, even though when you leave heterosexuality, you still live in a heterosexual world. But this is what leaving heterosexuality felt like, leaving a life, leaving a world where your being is supported. And that's how things felt for me, uh, that I was exiting a world where my being was supported and entering into the complete unknown. But the pandemic showed me that everything can change. So that's in some way why I faced the truth about myself that I'd been shoving down my whole life. Um, so throughout the course of my doctoral research, uh, my supervisor, Ardra Cole, always told me that if you want to propose something creative, uh, you should show what it looks like. Um, so I decided to end by reading a story that um, I wrote that explores my feelings about my queer identity and appearance, and more specifically, this story is about clothing and whether my new identification as queer would somehow change the way I dressed. We were silently standing beside my grandmother's casket in the funeral home when I said, she made a great blueberry pie. Her black forest cake was the best, my aunt added. After the viewing, when we were back in the car, I remembered that I'd written about my other grandmother's cherry cheesecake in the eulogy I delivered during her funeral. I don't have a dessert, I told Jack. What will people say when I die, that I did a PhD? 
They would say you were stylish, he said. I love this whole power suit thing you have going on here. Oh my God, the shoes. A young man at the bookstore clasped his hands in front of his chest the other day when he saw my robin egg blue patent leather brogues. They went well with the ta tailored teal suit I happened to be wearing. Every single place you go, someone compliments you, Jack said when we first started dating. You go for Chinese and the waitress likes your necklace. You go for a walk and someone on the street likes your coat. You go to the movies and the girl selling tickets likes your dress. What's it like to be complimented everywhere you go? I don't know, I remember saying. The truth is, well, it's not bad. My interest in fashion started in junior high, at which time I was voted fashion plate of St. Agnes. In high school, my English teacher beckoned me over to his desk one day and said that I reminded him of Sophia Loren. A paper bag looks more like Sophia Loren than I do. I can only assume the compliment had something to do with the way my clothing helped me carry myself. If a timid teenager can somehow resemble an Italian bombshell, there is a lot to be said for a well thought out ensemble. For a brief stint in grade 10, I took to wearing my grandmother's white bell bottoms from the 70s. Whereas I was always shy, my clothing never was. In undergrad, it wasn't uncommon for someone to ask whether I was from New York. It thrilled me a bit to think that my style of dress exuded the excitement of a place much bigger and better. Even now, strangers in Halifax often ask, where are you visiting from? When I lived in Montreal, friends would rush over to my closet just to take a look, as if it were a museum, which in some ways I suppose it was, a collection of selves. How does she know which shoes to wear? A friend's boyfriend asked when he saw a photo of my bookshelf of heels. After graduate school, the famed fashion journalist, Jeannie Becker, came to my apartment with the camera crew, and my closet would, was broadcast all across the country. The profile of me as a stylish Canadian aired on daytime television. The idea of the segment was to present viewers with the opposite of a makeover by featuring someone who didn't need one. In one scene, I hold up a nautical looking coat, navy with gold buttons, and tell Jeannie that I was reading Moby Dick when I bought it. When she pulls out a dress with a tulle ballerina tutu on the bottom, I tell her, well, if it's never actually in style, then it can never go out of style. Why don't you have a fashion blog? People have often asked. I tried to explain that it isn't words about clothing that I find so enticing, it's the physical objects themselves, the various colors, the feel of different textures, the way you can play. In a museum, I will spend hours reading the art labels, getting the stories behind the artists and the subjects of each painting, eventually having to remind myself to look at the art. But with fashion magazines, I gravitate toward the photographs. At one point, I contemplated studying fashion history. All women like fashion my father proclaimed dismissively. I always felt a bit ashamed by my interest in clothing, the frivolity of it. When I first came out as queer, my friend Lena suggested that it might take me some time to figure out how I want to be in the world. While she was categorically right in terms of the work it would take for me to probe who I am, I assured her that I wouldn't be changing my style of dress in order to suit some preconceived notion of what a lesbian should look like. Yet almost a year later, when I found myself going on a date with Parker and her queer friends, I stood in the mirror and wondered whether my dress looked too feminine. When I asked Parker how she would describe her style, she said, I dress like a 16 year old boy who hasn't quite got it together. People make assumptions tied to gender based on clothing. But as Jen Chaplin notes, Clothes offer a way to try on different identities, different manifestations of selfhood. They express more than gender, certainly more than binary gender and more than sexuality too. My two idols when it comes to style are Tom Wolfe and Oscar Wilde. Their outsides seem as artistic, fanciful and extravagant as the insides of their books. Once I got to see Tom Wolfe read in Boston during a conference on narrative nonfiction, 
and he wore a three-piece white suit with a baby blue pocket square and a matching blue dress shirt with a wide 70s collar. I am not the only writer who jumbles up writing and wardrobe. Heidi Julevantis suggests, even when I was very young, I knew I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to be stylish because to be stylish was to be poised on the precipice between reality and fiction. As a young girl, the first novel I read was Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. As I myself tumbled down the rabbit hole along with Alice, the strange vividness of Wonderland surrounded me as if I had slipped from a black and white into technicolor. While I was concerned about the plight of Alice, the nonsensical world, at once both whimsical and terrifying, was what truly enchanted me. It was the first time I was aware of this link between story and style. I wanted to be the Queen of Hearts, I wanted to own the Cheshire Cat, and I wanted to have tea with the Mad Hatter. I think what I love is how when you are reading a good story, there is a sense of possibility and anything could happen feel. And this is the feeling you have sometimes in a small town vintage shop or as a child in your mother's closet. In other words, a good story can conjure up the feeling that you are somehow in that moment connected to all the important tales that have ever been told. And when you are wearing just the right thing, you can feel as if you're part of the wider world made up of all the people who have lived throughout time, something bigger than just yourself moving through space. Matilda Bernstein Sycamore writes, Sometimes when you don't write about something, it goes away. And sometimes when you don't write about something, it never goes away. One summer evening, when my friend Sloan and I were 13, we stood on the edge of a park near the road and counted how many men in passing cars honked at us. We wore ice cream colored tube tops and denim short shorts. At the time it felt like power. It seemed as if we were orchestrating the symphony of honks. Another time in a green miniskirt, I caused a traffic accident. This happened when a car stopped to allow me to cross the street and a man on a motorcycle ran into the back of the car because he was staring at me. Let them look, I suppose I thought triumphantly, but it felt less like power when a man grabbed my ass one time as I walked out of a movie theater wearing black velvet pants. And another time when I was jogging home from the gym in my workout wear and a man popped out of the bushes pretending to ask for directions, but then exposing himself to me. As Sarah Ahmed writes, Experiences like this, they seem to accumulate over time, gathering like things in a bag, but the bag is your body so that you feel like you are carrying more and more weight. The past becomes heavy. We all have different biographies of violence, entangled as they are with many aspects of ourselves. Things that happen because of how we are seen and how we are not seen. I suppose I'm thinking about this now because in a heterosexual world, you learn from a young age to associate the way you dress with desire. Now I feel differently moving through the world because I know that I am not attempting to attract the male gaze. Even if on the outside, this is just a secret I keep with myself. So that's the end of the story. And you might be thinking now, what does that have to do with meditative inquiry again? But I will just reiterate that it's my writing process um, where I saw sort of the overlap and the embracing of uncertainty and sort of exploratory nature, um, the similarities between those those parts of the process. Thank you so much, Christina. That was wonderful. And we'll bring you back for the Q and A. Um, so if people have questions for Christina, please hold them and put them in the chat as well. Thank you again. Perfect. And I should have mentioned uh, that Dr. McCaw is going to speak on behalf of Dr. John Kay as well. I'll give you a warning at um, uh, say three minutes, does that work? Perfect. Great, thank you. Welcome. Okay, so I hope you can see that. Yeah. All right, so thanks um, to Ashwani and the organizers and everyone else on, on the panel. Um, I'm coming uh, to you from Melbourne, Australia. It's late in, late in the evening here, um, past my bedtime. Um, but it's really exciting to be here. 
Um, so this is related to work I've done with my colleague, John Quay, uh, but I'll be representing the work today. So I want to acknowledge um, where I'm coming from. So yeah, from the place called Nam or Melbourne, um, as it's known in colonial language. And yeah, I want to acknowledge that, you know, I'm sitting here on uh, Wurundjeri, Wurrung land and acknowledge this land was never ceded. Um, and pay my respects to the elders in past and present and emerging and the processes of inquiry and learning and teaching that have been going on here um, for a very, very long time. Um, and you can see on that picture of Australia there, the little wedge down in the bottom right corner, that's the state of Victoria where I live. And then on the, on the Victorian map, you'll see a little yellow dot. And that's about where the, the town I, I live is uh, at there on uh, Wurundjeri land. So that's where I'm coming from. And I pay respects to, yeah, the, the First Nations people wherever you are today. So this, the contribution that um, John and I wanted to make to the book was motivated by an observation, and I'm quoting here, the project of meditative inquiry brings with it often counted in conventional method-centric considerations of education. First challenge is clearly conceptualizing the awareness grounding meditative inquiry. And the second is more a question of, of the how, what tools and practices might be available to educators to embark on meditative inquiry. And just very quickly, in summary, here's where we got to. So the kind of awareness underlying meditative inquiry we, we defined as aesthetically whole, non-dualistic, and held in a delicate embrace of non-grasping wonder and equanimity. And from there, we identified some invitations or entry points to meditative inquiry, grounded in the cultivation of non-clean, non-craving, through meditative practices of non-action, relaxation, of letting go and letting be. Now, thinking about this presentation, like Adrian, I felt this challenge of sort of being asked to, asked to speak to a chapter, a chapter already in existence, which in some ways has a lot of bits of philosophy in it. And so in a way, rather than try to present the arguments, I, I decided um, to sort of step sideways um, and just play with exploring some of the key ideas in the chapter through some visual artifacts. And I was really inspired I'd hear by Christina's um, chapter, and it was fantastic to hear that evolve in, in the presentation too. Um, with this idea of using, using um, artistic processes and, and, and products as part of meditative inquiry. Um, so what I'm going to do is present some um, participant drawings from my doctoral study. Um, so I worked with some uh, a group of new teachers who were also fairly committed meditation practitioners and really tried to work with them about, you know, what was the role of meditation in their life and how did it intersect state um, with their lives as beginning teachers. So I used participatory uh, visual methodology within a sort of qualitative um, inquiry with be these beginning teachers and part of it were these um, production of these drawings. And I really like this quote from Weber and Mitchell here about the significance um, of drawing. It says drawings offer a, a different kind of glimpse into human sense making than written or spoken texts do because they can express that which is not easily put into words, the ineffable, the elusive, that not yet thought through in the subconscious. And in particular, um, I really emphasize the use of visual metaphor in working with the participants. I mean, think about how metaphors work to holistically map uh, meaning from one domain to another. So using these ideas and presenting some uh, drawings, I wanna first step to the idea of reflection, which was in the title of this, this panel. So when I think about reflection, speaking generally, it seems like it's a kind of looking back at some other past experience, or maybe looking over to some aspect of the world, um, you know, for one's location, wherever one is. And John Dewey um, noted that a key reflective, uh, a feature of reflective thinking is that it is dualistic. It divides the time of the present from the absent time of the past, which is reflected upon. And it divides the self who is reflecting from the world, from objects, processes, and people being reflected. And as we remark in the chapter, reflection draws attentions to one's ego as distinct from others and things. So the first drawing I want to talk about um, has a lot of reflection in it. So this is from a participant, Edward. Um, and I think this drawing indicates something about how meditation can be understood through and with this metaphor of reflection. So Edward was a mathematics teacher and a science, oh, sorry, mathematics and science graduate studying to be a secondary teacher at the time of the research. 
And in this drawing, Ed was playing with metaphors uh, for the operation of meditation, which for him was in the Vipassana uh, tradition um, taught by Goenka, you might know. So there's actually two parts to this drawing I want to talk about. And on the, on the left side, you'll see um, the first attempt that Edward made during this um, interview we were doing. And it appears to be a window looking out to a scene there. However, Edward explained to me in the interview that this was in fact a mirror reflecting a landscape behind the view. But of course, in the mirror, the viewer is also able to see themselves reflected. And for Edward, this captured the idea that meditation enabled one to view things differently, including, quoting here, your own thoughts and your own self. Something about this first image didn't satisfy him. So on the right side, you'll see second attempt. So in the second attempt, the meditator is now standing between four mirrors and the meditator's reflection now becomes reflected in the opposite mirror and so on and so on ad infinitum. So for Edward, this captures how the process of looking out and looking in, in meditation, always eludes a final mastery. How, and I'm, I'm quoting him here, how you look at one reflection and there's always one behind it. And he continues. So I guess there's always multiple layers to something. So if you think you've got it all figured out, you probably don't. There's always more going on. So this back and forth dynamic of recursive reflections starts to hint at something beyond the dualistic structure of reflection of the self as a knowing subject observing itself as an object to be known. In a way, it hints towards infinity. Is anyone, anyone who's ever tried to look at two facing mirrors has ever kind of um, uh, attempted to do, and also towards the unknowable and towards a, a complication of this simple division between the inside and the outside or between the self and the world in contemplative experience. But I'd say in this sort of picture, duality is not quite overcome. The self is still divided from the world and from its many reflections. So now I'd like to explore how dualistic, the divided sort of self emerges in the practice of the teacher. Because I was really working with um, educators, working to be uh, training to be school teachers. So I want to look at this. This is from Mark, um, the drawing from uh, the initial interview I conducted with Mark. Um, now he was in his second year of a, a primary or elementary uh, teaching degree at the time. And his drawing depicts a somewhat typical classroom scene. You'll see here um, the figure of the teacher is standing next to a whiteboard addressing some students. But you'll notice there is something peculiar about the teacher in this case. A striking visual feature is the metaphorical replacement of the teacher's head with a series of gym weights. Now, uh, Mark was com also a committed Vipassana practitioner, but he was also spending a lot of time at the gym during the research period. And you can see this all converging in the metaphors he's taking up. Now, as Mark explains, these weights sit on the shoulders of the teacher and indicate, and I'm quoting in here, personal values, parents, curriculum. And then there's little other little things swirling around like values, thoughts, and experience. Just zooming in there. So looking closer at this picture, you can see that three of the weights are labeled curriculum, 20 kilograms, personal values, 20 kilograms, parents, 30 kilograms. And there's a sense that instead of having their own head, the teacher is seeing and experiencing the classroom with or through these heavy objects, which implies, of course, not seeing very well. So this image of the weights and the head illustrates how for Mark, structural conditions of curriculum policy and state authority become infused into the micro interactions of teaching. And far from being sort of exterior pressures, these conditions show up as weights in the head, aspects of the beginning teacher's ego identity. Here, the weight of curriculum obstructs the teacher from expressing and enacting his own priorities and visions of education, in this case, through honest interactions with students. So you can see the speech bubble at the bottom right there. And the student asks this quite legitimate question, but sir, what if I don't want to study this? And of course, all the teacher can respond with, you don't have a choice, it's in the curriculum. So this leaves them divided from their own authentic response, which is to acknowledge that, uh, acknowledge that the student's question is fully legitimate, as shown in the little um, thought bubble at the top left. However, in addition to curriculum, there are plenty of other weights there too, experience, values, parents, and thoughts. So these weights represent the way interior factors might interfere with clear teacher perception and judgment. So quoting Mark here, he says, so you've got your own experience, which I think you have to question a lot and be very open-minded about. And what you think is best for a student might not be the best thing and trying to be open-minded and to see through those things. So I guess those are all obstacles and weights that you wanna try and be free of and try to listen to what students are saying. 
So Mark's commentary here reveals the way his attempts to care for and connect with students get clouded and distorted by experience, values, and other conditionings of personal and social history. Now, although this drawing was produced in a reflective, retrospective mode, it's clear that his struggle with the weights in the head is not just a reflective one, but presents an experience lived out and embodied in the moment as practices in the classroom. Now, within his meditation tradition in Vipassana, it is bodily sensations, roughly speaking, that represent condensations of habitual reactive responses to experience, reactions of attachment, craving, and aversion, which reproduce cycles of thought and action. So, in this view, the weights in the head metaphorically represent these kind of knots of habitual conditioning. Now, corresponding to this, the core meditation practice in that tradition entails building uh, and refining uh, the capacity to focus one's awareness, but then observing subtle bodily sensations with an orientation of acceptance, non-judgment, or equanimity. Now, this practice is understood to begin a subtle and profound dissolution of these knots of conditioning and with them the ingrained habits of thinking, feeling, perceiving, and judging. So, in being less clouded by habitual patterns, the meditator is meant to be more able to encounter the phenomena of life in, in immediacy and new possibilities for action may arise. As summarized by Goenka there, he says, out of ignorance, we keep reacting in ways which harm ourselves and others. But when wisdom arises, the wisdom of observing reality as it is, this habit of reacting falls away. When we cease to react blindly, then we are capable of real action, action proceeding from a balanced mind. Now, when thinking about social change, Kumar in 2013 recommends this kind of work. Instead of being structure oriented, what is far more significant is that each one of us goes to the very depths of our psychological reality, its contradictions, conflicts, and problems to understand how we are part and parcel of this exploitative social reality. And I really think Mark's drawing and the kind of contemplation it inspires is exactly this kind of exploration. Just maybe through sustained practices of its stable attention, letting go and letting be, these habits of clinging and craving begin to subside and a new way of seeing becomes possible. Maybe what Kumar calls pure observation. From this, the many divisions in the scene of the teacher from the student and of the teacher from themselves might drop away. Our heavy headed teacher with the weights in the head now removed might find new clarity, connection and spontaneity and discover a different way to respond to the student's legitimate question, maybe with honesty and compassion. Now, one reason I really love this uh, image of the teacher with the weights in the head is that it also hints at non-duality. If we think of the weights as a kind of ego, then once the weights are removed or put down, then what is left where the head used to be? Well, nothing. And once there is emptiness where the ego used to be, well, there can no longer be any separation between self and world. So as we write in the chapter, dualistic experience distinguishes the ego as separate from others and things, whereas non-dualistic experience does not. The ego disappears because experience is not being analyzed reflectively. So this leads me to imagine well, what might teaching be like when duality and division drop away. So I'm going to turn to my last drawing here. This is from Ren. And Ren, Ren was an employed teacher just entering his fifth year of practice. He was also a student of uh, Vipassana meditation, but was also at the time exploring uh, contemplation through Japanese tea ceremony, which was quite significant at the time. Now, I hope you can see it on the screen there. It was a very sparse, light line drawing. Um, and I think it captures the dynamics of this non-duality in a simple and well-known contemplative metaphor. So in the sort of minimalist style of Zen painting, an outline of a rock descends into water, producing ripples on the surface. So Ren explains, and I'm quoting here, it's working off this idea of being like water or a mind like water. So you throw a rock into a pond and the water responds just as it should, not blowing it up and not underselling it. So this physical metaphor expresses awareness, receptivity, and a kind of skillful and natural proportionality in teachers' responses to classroom situations. So along with this metaphorical drawing, um, Ren offered uh, a story of teaching practice um, and a story of responding to an incident that happened in one of his secondary school classes. 
so I'll just outline this story a bit to kind of unpack this, um, the rock and the water metaphor a bit further. So Rin was asked to cover a class for a colleague. And just after he introduced himself to the class, which he didn't really know that well, he thought he overheard a student saying something that was something was of concern. As, as Ren said, a quick ditty or a rhyme with one or two things that just, just weren't, weren't appropriate for, the, for the, uh, the context. So the first part of being like water in this case involved noticing. Noticing what seemed to be comments of concern by a student and then kind of rapidly, intuitively scanning the room just to verify uh, his hunch. And next was responding proportionately. So not jumping to conclusions and disciplining the student publicly, but just taking, uh, taking the student aside just for a chat to ascertain her perception of the situation, to reset expectations, and then you know, redirect back to the focus of the lesson. Of course, in the, in the natural metaphor, the amount and intensity of ripples produced when the rock falls into the water are always in perfect proportion to the size, shape, and velocity of the rock. Thus, and similarly, the teacher's response should only ever be just enough or proportional to the substance of the event. So the final part of being like water is moving on. The water's surface, of course, settles spontaneously after the rocks hits it, retaining no trace of the event. And correspondingly, the teacher consciously lets go of any grievances or frustration to ensure that they don't carry that over into any future interactions with the student. Now, it would be possible to interpret that story as a teacher trying to you know, just enforce the rules or assert their power and authority. But the way I understood it was as a sincere and authentic expression of this teacher's commitment to respect and to dignity as foundations for educational work. And I really think the, the, the play of metaphor is important um, here. Unlike with Edwards or Mark's drawing, there is no teacher in the scene. The metaphor translates directly and holistically between the domain of nature and the domain of education. Therefore, the suggestion is not just to be like or think like water. As non-dual awareness, the teacher takes on a kind of watery way of being, just as the water doesn't have to stop and think and deliberate over how much to splash in response to a stone. The teacher as water just moves naturally and intuitively to the surrounding con conditions and then moves on, staying receptive and open to what comes next. So this kind, this kind of natural spontaneity illustrates the way that teaching as meditative inquiry cannot be defined by a method or a recipe. What remains primary is openness and responsiveness to the actual situations of practice. And Rand, in one of our conversations, really artfully summarized this as being with the students rather than with the plant. I'll okay, just, so I'll just wrap up. Yeah, a yeah, couple minutes warning. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up now. Thanks very much. Lovely. So um, as we argue in the chapter, central to meditative inquiry is non-dual awareness. Now, admittedly, the idea of non-dual awareness and non-duality can invoke something very esoteric or mystical. And indeed, a deep embrace of non-duality may be one of the foundations for mystical experience. But for the unenlightened amongst us, we'll just have to wait to find out. But this non-dual awareness is also something that is entirely ordinary. As Dewey argues, using the label of aesthetic experience, Non-duality is the basis for our regular pragmatic engagement even in, in everyday life. It is just the way we get along when reflection and analysis are not necessary for getting by. The trick is we just fail to recognize this because our habits of recognition or reflection are themselves dualistic. Whenever we take the time to look, what we see is separation. But whenever we cease to look, separateness disappears. So the art of meditation then is simply to remember the profound ordinariness and to look without disrupting the wholeness of non-duality. So there's no method or recipe for finding non-dual awareness, just as Kumar argues there is no recipe for meditative inquiry. What it takes is more a giving up of mechanical habitual thought, but we argue this giving up actually does take practice. And I would argue that formal meditation as a kind of method can be helpful here. Because like non-duality, formal meditation can seem obscure, difficult and esoteric and removed from everyday affairs. But it can also be understood really simply as watching caringly the many knots of craving and aversion, of conditioning and association, also many weights in the head, and letting them go on their way. It is the discipline of not getting caught up in something extra, something beyond, uh, the thing towards which we are striving, maybe seeking growth, and just holding in mind the simple non-duality of ordinary experience. 
In this simple manner, Trungpa calls meditation a dignified approach to learning how to be here. And in being here, we are left with a remarkable and authentic place to begin our work as educators. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. So I'll bring in or we'll bring in all the panelists and for people watching, please think of your questions and post them in the chat. We're just going to open it up right now. Uh, Christina and Adrian, can I ask you to turn on your cameras so we can spotlight you? Perfect. So we'll just give people a quick minute to think of their questions. But is there anything um, that any of you would like to respond to each other's work potentially? I have I just thought to I have sorry, we all jumped in at the same time. Sorry, I, yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. But just uh, I, I, I have been uh, sending individual messages to 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 all of you. But it was so wonderful to hear your presentation. To read your chapter is a different thing, and to hearing your presentation is a different thing. So those of you uh, who are uh, listening to this presentation, when you will read the chapter, you will find that they have already moved on from what they worked on and 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 have shared a, a lot of wonderful uh, new insights that they have been thinking thereafter so uh, it was very insightful for me to listen to you it was not as if you were repeating the chapter that you wrote but something completely new for me so thank you for doing that Chris, sorry, you can go ahead now if you wish to share your thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a small remark that um, it, one really positive experience with me uh, was that was the um, the the play between my presentation and, and Christina's because um, I hadn't really thought about it, but the, the it brought up to me the question of how different uh, mediums of expression can create really different contexts for exploration, and I, I hadn't thought about that, but hearing Christina's story. And then looking at it against the the drawings, I just thought there's so much richness richness there that I hadn't really considered before. Um, and as Ashwani said, I kind of stepped sideways from what's actually in the chapter um, in terms of presenting those drawings. They're not they're not in the chapter, but I just really enjoyed how that you know that that implicitly um, sort of accidentally brought up this question of mediums for exploration. So thanks, Christina, for your story. Um, and yeah, just just enjoyed that. Yeah, and I was I was just going to add as well that I really appreciated the um, interplay between presentations and reading everybody's chapter before this. It was really, you know, I, I love the way Ashwani works. <laughs> He's very good at like inviting people in and bringing kind of like-minded folks together, and and that's what I really appreciate about the spirit behind this conference. So, yeah, Adam has a. Question I was just going to read that out. Would you like me to read it to everybody? Sure. Yeah. If you'd like. Okay. So he says, Adrian, you have me reflecting on your thoughts on dirt, negative Western connotations regarding dirty. You touched on in your Fuk, Fuk, excuse me, Fukna conversation with Dr. Nicholas Naguf, Nafuk. At the end of your session, you mentioned loss. Is this the loss that cannot be used to fertilize, grow, an extinction? Are you signifying a need to be more mindful of what is being lost and not reactivated through intercourse? Thank you for that like really um, generative and, and specific conversation. I'm always um, like, Adam does this really well and, and so do a lot of people, but like, um, it's always such an honor when somebody reads and pays attention to what you're saying. And, and um, you know, uh, I just, I really appreciate Adam and, and the question in general um, to respond. So um, in that conversation with uh, Dr. Nick Ningafuk at uh, um, University of Ottawa, I talked about, uh, there's a, a well-known article uh, in the field of discard studies um, called dirt 
or waste isn't matter out of place. And it presents this idea that dirt, one definition of it is matter out of place. And I, I kind of problematize that in, in my conversation with Nick. Um, and thinking from vital materialist perspectives, um, we can kind of say that waste is a matter out of place as long as we defamiliarize the systems that, that give it a place. Um, but yeah, it is very much connected to my thinking around loss, Adam. Um, and I have an article coming out in the Journal of Curriculum Theorizing, it was just accepted like last week. So, and, and that really goes into it in the context of thinking about death and thinking about the human corpse. Uh, and when deemed human, uh, our veneration of that corpse, uh, we treat it as a waste, but a very special waste, a waste that requires us to mourn. Um, and so thinking from a materialist perspective, this is marking a loss in a very particular way, right? Uh, and so my argument in that article, and I'm going totally far afield here, but it is connected to meditative inquiry in some ways, is that um, we need to mark our losses, right? Whether it's, you know, part of our assemblage, uh, you, you know, whether it's uh, um, the casualties of living with the meat we eat, the waste we create, we need to mourn those losses, but also our existential and our, our um, you know, COVID-19 is a, a filled with losses, right? And I, I kind of alluded to Judith Butler's work on grievability, <laughs> but um, I, I won't go into it too far, but there is unequal grievability in society, right? Some losses cannot be marked as a loss and they are often racialized, sexualized and naturalized others. Um, and so, you know, I think my thinking about mourning, my thinking about loss is to mark those losses as a loss. Um, and in the context of education, so, you know, materialist social education tends to be more focused on the individual subjectivity. For me, I think there are existential losses as well in our learning, as well as material and as well as social losses. But there are also like, like, I am not the same person I was when I wrote that chapter. Uh, as a result of my PhD, there have been changes in me and they have not all been positive, you know, and to think about them as like this growth I think is highly problematic and deleterious to like a true understanding of who we are. So maybe that's the connection to meditative inquiry there. Thanks again, Adam. That's a really uh, awesome question. There is a comment for you, uh, Chris, if you want to respond to that, being with the students rather than with the plan. Priceless suggestion to an educator. Would you like to share any reflections on that? Um, just that's that's one of the wonderful things about doing um, work with other educators. Um, you know, you have great conversations and sometimes they just pull together in a small nugget of wisdom, something that is really simple and powerful. So yeah, thanks for the comment. I agree. It, it stays with me a lot. Um, we, need, we need these simple things to, as anchors, to kind of... Um, to, to, to remind ourselves. Um, so yeah, uh, appreciate that. Um, There's a great question by Martin Morrison. Would anybody like to tackle that? Would you like me to read it? Sure, yeah. I am wondering if the visceral emotions that a sense of loss elicits requires a shift in perspective that meditative inquiry can support by, but requires a critical challenge and confrontation with the loss. What is the difference between critical reflection, critical self-reflection and meditative inquiry in the process of learning? Just one thing, Ali, uh, what I would want all of us to contemplate on that question on our own time, because mm -hmm. this is break time. It is, and, we're getting close to the end. Yeah, yeah, so we have to be very mindful, otherwise the other present, presenters uh, sure. may have difficulty. So everybody, let's take a uh, 10 minutes break and, and then we will uh, see the next presentation, next panel. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much, panelists. Thank you. Chris, Chris.